When we get into books like 1 and 2 Samuel, we're into a much easier part of the Bible to read because it's all story. True story, but it's narrative. And the narrative parts of the Bible we don't have much difficulty with. However, we do. Uh, it depends entirely why we read them and what we're trying to get out of them. So what I want to do in the two talks on 1 and 2 Samuel, in the first talk I want to give you an overview just to remind you of the story and the shape of the story and how it develops. And then in the second talk I want to ask, now what are you going to get out of these stories? At what level are you going to read them? So those are the two talks. Now 1 and 2 Samuel are actually one book in the Hebrew Old Testament. We've divided them into two books because together they were a bit long, but they really belong together. They are one book. And this one big book of Samuel covers 150 years of history. Can you imagine writing a book this size about the last 150 years of English history? You know, it's crazy. But this is history written from God's angle, so it's only included what is important and significant to God. And therefore it misses out a whole lot of the history. There are many things that happened in this 150 years which might be of interest to us, but are not of interest to God. And in the Hebrew Old Testament, these books are not called history, they are called prophets. They belong, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, belong to what they call the former prophets because this is history from a prophetic point of view. This is history as the prophets see it and they see it the way God sees it. And therefore these books are named after the prophet who dominates the story, namely Samuel. And he probably wrote them down. We know from other scriptures that prophets wrote down the history of their people from God's point of view. And so they would include things that were important to God and exclude things that were of no interest to God. So it is prophetic history and therefore the Jews call this prophet, the prophecy books of Samuel. Now these 150 years come at the end of a thousand years. Abraham is dated around 2000 BC. King David came to the throne in 1000 BC. In fact, this very year, 1996, is the 3000th anniversary of David establishing his capital in Jerusalem. And there are great celebrations in Jerusalem this year because of that. So, from 2000 to 1000 BC, the people of Israel, starting out as an old man, of 75, became a family, a tribe, a people, a nation of 12 tribes, and under David they became an empire and got all the promised land. This was the peak of their history. From Abraham all the way up to David took a thousand years. And the two books of Samuel cover the last century and a half of that slow but sure climb to the peak of their peace and prosperity. And David is at the top. After him, as we shall see in the book of Kings, everything went downhill and they lost it all in just 500 years. But to this day, the Jew looks back on King David as the man who stood at the peak of their history when they had all the land God promised them, when they had peace and prosperity, when the Philistines were finished and they're still praying for another king like David. They call him the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Anointed One. They're still hoping for a son of David to take the throne of Israel again. You can understand why this was their golden age. Now we're looking at the last 150 years of that upward rise to the empire of David. And we need to look at the major overall pattern. I'll show you both cards right away. 1 Samuel begins in the first 12 chapters with the story of the last judge. Samuel was the last prophet who judged the people following the book of Judges. So he was the last judge and the last prophet to lead the people of Israel. 
You see, Israel went through four periods of 500 years during which they had quite a different kind of leadership. In the first 500 years, from 2000 to 1500, they were led by patriarchs, as we call them, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. In the next 500 years, they were led by prophets from Moses through to Samuel. In the next 500 years, they were led by princes or kings from Saul through to Zedekiah. In the last 500 years BC, they were led by priests from Joshua through to Annas and Caiaphas. So they'd had every kind of leadership. They'd had patriarchs, prophets, princes and priests. And of course, they really needed every kind of leader. They needed someone who would be prophet, priest and king rolled into one and the everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. And they wouldn't get that until Jesus came. So we are in the changeover from being led by prophets to being led by kings. And the second half of the book of Samuel is about the first king they had, Saul. And he was man's choice. God approved it, but it was a choice made by the people, democratically. They elected him. They thought he was the best man. And God approved that and allowed them to have him, but he was not God's choice. And we know the sad downward tale of Saul. He was their first king and probably from one point of view their worst. Then in 2 Samuel, the whole of it is about the best king they ever had. You can see therefore that David dominates the books of Samuel. Not only is the whole of 2 Samuel about him, but when you read the story of King Saul, most of it is about David. So that he dominates the whole thing. His name is just a magic word. David, or Dawith, as we should call him. Now the story centers first then on Samuel and Saul in what we call 1 Samuel. And in each case, their relationships in four directions are the key to understanding the story. Three of those relationships are with individuals, and the fourth is with the whole people, a whole people. So that for Samuel, the individuals he relates to are Hannah, Eli, or Eli, as we should say, and Saul, or Saul, as if you pronounce his name the Hebrew way, and the people that he related to Israel. When Saul came along, the three personal relationships that uh, were so crucial to his reign were with his son Jonathan, with uh, the prophet Samuel, and that relationship came to a very sharp end, and then his relationship to the young David, who appeared at his court, and finally, his relationship with the Philistines, who killed him, and his son Jonathan. So you can see there's a clear shape to the stories. Three relationships with individuals and one with a people. And somehow we learn about their characters from these four relationships. David himself, uh, you can summarize his life in four chapters. In, out, up, down. <laughs> and the in and the out take place during Saul's reign. And as we shall see, the up and the down take place in his own reign. But to remember the story of David, I just think of those four words. In to the court and out again. Up to the top of the court and down again. So in, out, up, down, and you've got the four chapters of David's life. Let's begin with Samuel and uh, just look at some of the things. If you were brought up in Sunday school, you know all these stories backwards. Hannah and little boy Samuel and the way she made a... A, a new coat for him every year, a little bigger, and took it up to the temple where he was serving the priest Eli. But it begins with Hannah, an anxious wife. She was one of two wives, and the other wife, Elkanah, had many children, but she had none. She was barren. Again and again through Scripture, God begins again with a barren woman. Have you ever noticed that? Sarah was barren. Hannah was barren. Elizabeth was barren. Had John the Baptist. God is able to do amazing things for a barren woman. And when it seems as if the stories come to an end, that's where God begins. And it began with Hannah. And Hannah was so hurt by this uh, other wife who had lots of children and who teased her, indeed mocked her, that she couldn't produce 
children for the husband. She went up to the temple at Shiloh. That temple has recently been excavated, but I've got a picture here of the temple at Shiloh before it was excavated. All you can see is just a kind of circle of stones, but uh, if you went to Shiloh today, you'd find they have excavated that now, and it's uh, all been brought to light. But that's the place up in the hills, just a heap of rubble now. But it was in Shiloh that they kept the Ark of the Covenant. I've got that to show you. Oh, oops, there goes another bit. I lent this to someone, it came back in pieces, his children got at it. Anyway, there's the Ark of the Covenant, and this was the focus of their national worship, and it was in Shiloh at this time. Oops, I've given you a preview there. And so that's where they went to pray, and that's where Ellie, the priest, ministered. And Hannah went up there, and she was praying, not aloud, her lips were moving, and Ellie thought she was drunk. But she said, no, I'm praying for a little boy. And I've promised the Lord that if he gives me a boy, I'll give the boy back to the Lord to serve him. That's how Samuel was born. We next see him ministering to the priest, Ellie, looking after the priest. And then the classic night, you must have heard of this, uh, the night when he heard the voice, Samuel, Samuel. And he ran into Ellie and said, yes, what did you want? I didn't call you. Lie down again. Samuel, Samuel. Ran into Ellie. What did you want? I didn't call you. And finally, the old man said, I think it's God wants to speak to you. <laughs> Go back and lie down. If he calls you again, just say, speak, Lord. I'm listening. And then the little boy of 12 was told a terrible thing. God said he was going to judge the old man, Ellie. Why? Well, because his two boys, who would inherit the priesthood, were misbehaving badly and Ellie wasn't doing anything about it. It says when the people came to bring their roast lamb offerings for the Lord, his two boys would pick all the nice joints and run off and eat them instead of offering them to the Lord. And even worse, it says that when a pretty girl came to make an offering, they grabbed her and took her behind the tent and had sex with her. This was going on in the high priest's house. And the boy 12 was told, Ellie is finished. I'm calling you to take over the lead. That's the rest of the story. They don't usually tell you that bit in Sunday school, you know, I don't know why, but uh, <laughs> they just take you up to speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, and then it finishes, you know. But that was the message God gave him. So Samuel replaced Ellie, not as priest, but as leader of the people. Hannah got her wish, and uh, she came to visit the boy once a year, bringing him a new, larger coat. It's a, it's a lovely story. At that time, Israel went out in pride and arrogance to defeat the Philistines. And they thought the quickest way was to take this with them, that that would scare the Philistines to death, and somehow it, was, it had become a kind of charm, a kind of talisman, a kind of lucky charm, you know? And if we take the ark, we'll beat them. Well, of course, that kind of pride goes before a fall, and they were defeated, and 4,000 Israelites died, and they came back without this. And it was taken away by the Philistines, who then suffered all kinds of troubles as a result and they finally sent it back on a cart pulled by two cows who pulled it straight for Jerusalem. One of those lovely instances where God controls the animal world. But uh, that was the arrogant army of Israel that suffered a very bad defeat. And it was Samuel who then said, you see the reason why the Philistines killed so many of you and won the battle was because the sin among you. That was Samuel's first real ministry as a prophet. And he got them to destroy the pagan gods in their homes because they'd been adopting all the religion of the Amorites around them. And he cleaned them up and the result was they went against the Philistines again and this time they won. That's in simple form the story of Israel and her neighbors. Whenever they disobeyed God, an enemy would come and defeat them. And whenever they repented and put things right, they defeated the enemy and they got the land back. 
and got freedom again. And it just went on and on and on like that. And it was so often the Philistines who were the problem. The last thing that Samuel did as a prophet was to anoint Saul as king. The people came to Samuel and they said, we want to be like everybody else. They have a king they can see. And our king is invisible and it's no fun having an invisible king. They knew that God was their king, but when they went into battle, nobody could see their king. They wanted a visible leader. And they said, Samuel, we want a king to lead us. And Samuel was very offended because he went to God and he said, God, they want a king and I'm their leader. And God said, no, Samuel, you're not. I am. Which is a lovely humorous touch. And that put Samuel in his place. But then God said an interesting thing. Go and tell them that kings come expensive. They will tax you. Central government is an expensive thing to have. There's something terribly relevant about all this. <laughs> I, I don't need to apply it to you, need I? He said, he'll want an army, so he'll take your young men as soldiers. He'll want a big palace, he'll take your daughters as cooks. And he'll need an awful lot of money to run his palace and to run his government. So you get ready for taxes. And Samuel went back to the people and said, kings come expensive. They said, we still want one. So Samuel went back to the Lord and said, they still want one. And the Lord said, well, let them have one. You can almost feel the Lord's, <laughs> I'm fed up with them. And so they chose one. They chose a man because he was taller than anybody else. And because he was more handsome than anybody else. It says he was head and shoulders above everybody. That's the kind of hero they wanted. I imagine Colonel Nasser. You know, there's something about Nasser in Egypt. He was taller than all the other Arabs. Very handsome. This is the kind of king that Middle East peoples like. So they chose him. I remember years ago there was a preacher down in Surrey, and Baxter, who was preaching about Saul, and he preached about this head and shoulders man. And he came one day, one morning to the rostrum, and there, were, there was a bottle of head and shoulders shampoo <laughs> <laughs> on the rostrum. <laughs> and he didn't know what it was actually, being an American. <laughs> But this was the head and shoulders man. This was the man who was tall, handsome. And when they saw him in battle, the enemy would run. But that's not how God chooses. And later, when God chose David, you get this very important word. The Lord doesn't look at a man's appearance. He looks at the heart. Well, he gave them the king they wanted. And in the first part of his reign, he did quite well. Both Saul and David started well but finished badly. They both started well and finished badly. Yet, David was the man after God's own heart. And one of the things you've got to ask is why, when both men started well and finished badly, why God said, David's my man and Saul isn't? It's a very interesting question. And we'll try and answer it shortly. Let's look at Saul briefly, his story. His relationships with Jonathan were interesting. When Jonathan went out and fought the Philistines and defeated them, Saul was a very proud father. He says, my son Jonathan did that. Then Jonathan made a mistake. He went out again without telling his father he was going. And he got a great victory again. And now Saul's weakness began to appear. Saul was jealous of his son the second time. Because people were all talking about Jonathan now. And Saul was a man who couldn't stand other people succeeding around him. This was the great weakness. We shall see in King David, King David's greatest strength was that he could relate well to gifted people around him. He could honor people who succeeded around him. Now this goes on in business, it goes on in families, it goes on in all sorts of places. But you know that it's a weakness if you can't stand gifted people around you. If you don't like others being praised in your presence. Now this was Saul's weakness and it came first with his son Jonathan. At first he'd been proud of his son. He would go into battle and come back victorious. That's my son. But now when people say, isn't Jonathan great? It began to irritate the father. He began to fall out with his son. He fell out with Samuel. Because Samuel was still giving words of the Lord to the king and telling him how to arrange things. And there were one or two areas in which uh, Samuel got very angry with Saul. 
because Saul was an impatient man. And after one victory, Samuel said, now you're to wait in that place after you've won the battle, and I will come, and then we'll give sacrifices of thanksgiving to God. But Samuel was a bit slow in coming. And Saul just couldn't stand any, any longer wait, and he just said, right, I'm going to offer the sacrifices. And he did. And Samuel came and said, why did you offer them? I told you to wait until I got here. There's a more serious time later when Samuel said, the Lord says, go against these people, these Amalekites, go against them, and you destroy them and their flocks, because they are wicked people and they're to be wiped off the face of the earth. But when Samuel arrived after the battle, he could hear sheep bleating and cattle lowing. And he said, uh, I told you to slaughter these animals. And he found out that he hadn't even killed the king he'd defeated, Agag. And Samuel, it says, slew Agag or cut him in pieces before the altar of the Lord. And that's when Samuel said, Saul, to obey is better than sacrifice. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. That's been very widely misquoted. But nevertheless, in that context, it fits. And Samuel said, I'm never going to talk to you again. And he never met him again while he lived. He actually met him again once after Samuel died. When Saul went to a spiritist medium, and Samuel appeared to Saul, but for the rest of Saul's life he had no prophet to guide him. Therefore he had no way of finding out what was the Lord's will, whether he should go to battle or not. And uh, his advisors couldn't help him, and that's why secretly, though at the beginning of his reign, he had banned every medium from the land of Israel, which was good. But at the last, when he wanted to find out whether he should do something or not, he said, uh, did you kill all the mediums in the land? They said, no, there's one at uh, Shunem up in the north. It's still alive. Oh, he said, uh, don't tell anybody. He went secretly. I'm jumping ahead. Because the third person that he became angry with or fell out with was this young man, this young shepherd boy who was brought to the court primarily because he could play music. And by this time, Saul was deteriorating mentally as well as morally. And uh, psychologists have had a quite a long time discussing what really went wrong with Saul. But in fact, it says that at a certain point, the Holy Spirit left him and an unclean spirit took over. That can happen. And it happened to Saul. And now he was a man who was unpredictable, a man who was... Uh, could fly off the handle at a moment, a man people were scared of. They found that the one thing that could calm him down was music. In fact, music is a powerful weapon against evil spirits. And uh, they found this simple shepherd and they brought him. He was a skilled musician. He came and played. He was also a superb fighter. And you all know the story of David and Goliath and how Goliath died of surprise because such a thing had never entered his head before. I, I, you're with me. I came, I came back from Israel once, five stones heavier. <laughs> They're from the valley of Elah and from the very little brook. It's a fascinating valley. The sound carries right across it. And you can stand at the brook and you can just see this nine foot six man at one side shouting, who will challenge me, Goliath of Gath. And this little musician, this shepherd boy, was there. And he said, I'll fight him. You see, this was the kind of bloodless way they settled arguments in those days. Each army chose a champion and the two champions fought and whoever won, that won the battle. It saved an awful lot of blood and it was cheaper as well as... Uh, less costly in lives. So that's how it arose. And this great big giant, a Philistine, said, who's going to fight me? And David said, I will. With the first stone. I've watched uh, people in the Middle East use a sling. And you know, they sling it around like a person putting the shot and then they just let it go. And, and they can hit a stone, crack it, 
It, I can understand how it killed him. It was the first stone out of five. And this boy did it. Interesting, he refused to wear armor. It's a classic case of uh, not fitting into somebody else's shoes. But Saul said, put my armor on. And he tried Saul's armor and it didn't fit and he could hardly move. He said, I don't need armor. Let the God of Israel win this battle. Great story. And you all know it. But you can imagine Saul's feelings now. If he could be jealous of his own son, now they were saying Saul has killed thousands, but David tens of thousands. He's, he's the great national hero. My wife and I went to Florence. If you ever go, go and see this gigantic statue. It's called David by Michelangelo. I mean, it's a horrible statue, really, because it's nothing like David. It's like a Greek hero. And apart from anything else, he's not even circumcised. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous, really. <laughs> but um, this huge statue of David is saying something. David towers above everybody else in the Old Testament. He's, he's, he strides the world like a colossus, you know. He really dominates the whole scene from the very beginning. And yet he was just a shepherd boy. And in fact, he was the seventh child, seventh boy in the family. And Samuel was told by God, that's the king of my choice. And Samuel went away down to Bethlehem to David's home and said, Jesse, uh, I'd like to meet your boys. And Jesse, knowing this was the leader of Israel, the, the prophet Samuel, he paraded all his boys, big handsome fellows. And then Samuel said, nobody else? Because it's none of these. He said, well, there's the youngest, but he's out with the sheep. He's a nobody, in other words. And in came this young boy with a ruddy complexion, a sling in his hand and a guitar in the other. <laughs> And Samuel said, this is the boy. But of course, this was a problem. He was anointing someone else to be king while Saul was already king. Now, I believe Samuel wrote both the book of Judges and the book of Ruth and wrote them after he had anointed David and before Saul was dead because it fits. The last chapters of the book of Judges really have it in for the little tribe of Benjamin. It says horrible things about the tribe of Benjamin. You've read the book of Judges. And the last few chapters, the tribe of Benjamin nearly disappeared through its own sin and corruption. And then it's followed by this beautiful little book called Ruth. It's, it's such a beautiful country scene of kindness and love and a beautiful family. I think Samuel was doing something very simply of saying, you can't trust the little tribe of Benjamin. You need to look at Bethlehem. There's the good background. Do, do you see what I'm getting at? He's taking attention away from evil Benjamin, from which tribe Saul had come. And he's pointing people to Bethlehem, to the good people living there and saying, that's where we want to be looking. Because the last word in the book of Ruth is David. Now, that's just my theory, but when you compare the book of Judges and the book of Ruth with Samuel's sermons in the book of Samuel, it's exactly the same style. He used to preach history. That was his method. Well, now, I must move on. So, David became a suspected courtier and he had to flee for his life. Jonathan helped him, made a pact with him, had a covenant with him. It's the most amazing thing. Jonathan said, you're going to be the next king and I promise to be your subject. And he's the king's son. Here's a prince abdicating in favor of a shepherd boy. It's a wonderful story. The Bible says there's never been such love between two men as between David and Jonathan. And then foul minds today say they must have been gay. It is dreadful how people twist what they read and reveal their own minds. Well, he became a stalked outlaw. I've, I've got a picture here of uh, Ein Yedi. A lovely place to go. It's a stream 
down running into the Dead Sea. It's about halfway down the Dead Sea on the west side and you climb up a path through a deep ravine. You come to this lovely pool, we, we swam in it, and there's a cave just near the pool. That's where David hid from Saul and where Saul came in to relieve himself. And David cut off the bottom of his robe and didn't kill him, even though he was, he'd come with uh, 10,000 troops to kill David. And David let him off and then let him go out of the cave again and shouted after him, Saul, Saul, I'm a loyal subject. Why are you trying to kill me? And Saul was so shaken when he realized David could have killed him in the cave that uh, he repented temporally. He did that twice to David. But um, David wrote many of his psalms while he was hiding down here. Uh, if you've seen pictures of Masada, the great uh, rocky precipice, that's why David keeps writing about the rock, God being my rock and my refuge. It was that rock that he's talking about. And uh, when you see these places, you see why David had such psalms of loneliness. You know, everybody's against me, Lord, except you. That kind of note runs through all the first book of Psalms. And these psalms were written while he was on the run. The most extraordinary part of David's story, which again they never teach you in Sunday school, is that he became a mercenary to the Philistines. He'd gathered many men around him in a cave of Adullam, dissatisfied with the reign of Saul, and they turned to David, and he actually sold them and himself to be a mercenary force for the Philistines. They were highly suspicious of him, and there was one time when he had to feign madness and froth at the mouth. And then the worst thing happened. Saul and Jonathan together decided to do battle with the Philistines and David and his men were now mercenaries with the Philistines and would find themselves fighting against Saul and Jonathan. But God stepped in and the Philistine leader said, we mustn't go to battle against the Israelites with David and his men because they might turn traitor in the middle of the battle. So they never had to fight. But I'm afraid Saul and Jonathan were killed. And uh, if you ever go to a place called Beth Shan, the old gateway is still there. I've walked through it. And it was on that gateway that the bodies of Saul and his son Jonathan were hung after the battle with the Philistines. Now David could take over. But there were still many people loyal to Saul who didn't like David. And it was some years before he could take the throne. Let's just look now briefly at the story of 2 Samuel. We see the triumphant ascent of David in the first nine chapters. At first, a single tribe, the tribe of Judah, made him king in Hebron in the south. Then he settled the nation as one unit and actually took Jerusalem, which was in the middle of it all, and made an ideal capital. It was an impregnable town. All this time, even after they'd taken most of the land, Jerusalem was still in the hands of the Jebusites, and they couldn't take it. It was too well defended. It had a cliff on three sides, and therefore only needed to be defended on the north side. But he took it. And uh, you probably know the story of how he took it. It's a fascinating piece of military. If you go to Jerusalem today and look at it from the south, you'll see the temple at the top. The green line represents the city of David. It's a kind of tongue of land south of the present city wall. The only source of water was the Gihon Spring in the Kidron Valley, and it was outside the city wall, so they were very vulnerable. So at one stage, they had built a staircase inside the rock down to the spring outside the city wall. And it was through that staircase that David's right-hand man, Joab, got up into the city and took it for him. Years later, Hezekiah dug the tunnel which brought the water through the rock to the pool of Siloam inside the lower end of the city. So we've got the staircase and later the tunnel which brought the water inside and therefore made Jerusalem secure. Um, again, we can see these closer later if you want to. But this is an archaeologist's uh, chart or map of the staircase and Hezekiah's tunnel. 
and some of you will have walked through that tunnel. They've kept the water lower now, but when I went through it was up to here and it's really quite a frightening experience. But uh, it goes for half a mile through the rock. So that was how they took Jerusalem, through the staircase in the rock. And it's all described in uh, the book of Samuel. And it's nice when archaeologists discover it's all true. So he finished up with a sizable empire. He defeated the Ammonites, the Edomites, so many others around, and they all became part of a vast empire. And David was king, and the Philistines were defeated, and Israel was at the peak of its history. And then, on one afternoon, it all went wrong. The army was away fighting a battle, and David should have been leading them, but he felt like staying home. And a woman living in a house next door to the palace thought all the men were away, so she had a bath on the roof. But David was still there, and he saw her. Her name was Bathsheba. And he broke five out of ten commandments. He coveted his neighbor's wife. He bore false witness against the husband. He stole the wife. He committed adultery with her and finally arranged the murder of the husband. It's a terrible story. And from that afternoon, everything went downhill. And over the next 500 years, they lost everything that God had given them. But it began that day. And one of the worst things that happened, not only did uh, Bathsheba become pregnant and Uriah, her husband, murdered by David's arrangement, but the baby was to die. He then took her into the palace, made her pregnant again, and now the baby was called Solomon, or Shalom, or peace, because they did have peace. But the prophet Nathan convicted David of his sin and told him a parable. For a year, David hid this in his heart. Read Psalm 32. He describes that year. He said he wasted away because he didn't confess it. A guilty conscience got that man right down. And then a year afterwards, Nathan the prophet came and said, I want to tell you a story. He said there was a poor shepherd had one little ewe lamb. And there was a wealthy shepherd lived next door who had a huge flock of sheep. And the wealthy shepherd came and stole the one little lamb. He said, now you're the king. What's your judgment? And David said, oh, the wealthy shepherd must die. And Nathan said, but you're the man. You've already got a harem full of wives, and you go and steal Uriah's Bathsheba. And that's when he wrote Psalm 51. It's a psalm of confession. It's a psalm when David cried out to God and said, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me now. Interesting that that was his main concern. Please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And create in me a clean heart, O oh God. He said, I was born a sinner. In sin my mother conceived me. That doesn't mean sex is wrong. It means that he knew he was like that from birth. And so a disgraced man, it led to a disintegrated family. And his own sons now did terrible things. His eldest son raped one of his sisters. And then his son Absalom got the popularity with the people and kicked his father out of Jerusalem. And David had to flee for his life wept all the way up the Mount of Olives as he fled from his own son Absalom. Then Absalom did a terrible thing. He took David's wives and he paraded them on the palace roof where everybody could see and then he had sex with them in public. And this is David now, disgraced man, disintegrated family and a discontented people. And the whole nation began to be discontented. Do you know what they were grumbling about? the behavior of the royal children. I said, David was a good king, but look at his children. How can the monarchy survive? And that's how it all began to end. We'll pick it up in the next talk.